Hello and welcome to Eggpesse Bank. My name is Jonas Turin. I'm head of asset management. Now we're trying to briefly give you an update on our house view. The graphs, as Jerome now mentioned, they are updated from last Thursday. So obviously, uh, some of from, from Friday. Uh, but obviously, the, the dramatic closes that we saw on Friday um, are not included in the graphs. However, we have not changed our house view as of yet, um, given the um, well, the package, whatever I should call it, that we've seen from, from US Treasury, FDIC and, and Fed, uh, which where they pretty much ring fence the whole issue uh, on, in terms of getting your deposits back, etc., etc. I wouldn't call it a bailout, given the fact that investors are done, employees are, are done in that sense. Um, however, they try to ring fence the, the, the fear factor of among deposits, i.e. try to stop and limit further or basically stop uh, for, for the bank runs. As such, what we're doing right now is that we follow the same traces that we were used to follow back in 08, or actually 06 or 07 or 08, i.e. what happens now in terms of pricing of risk. Uh, now obviously today is a bit of a coming uh, come together in the sense that Europe needs to catch up to the US, the US need to, to get, get the markets open and, and see what happens. The Biden was just out speaking. Um, and obviously, I think we can't go on uh, and making these type of, of adjustments and packages uh, after each event. What I think would happen is that they would quite neatly go back and, and, and pretty much discard the easing of capital requirements that the Trump administration put in place for banks of this size and pretty much bring them up to speed to be, again, uh, more more um, uh, controlled from, from capital requirements. Because we all know the now famous JP Morgan graph where we can see that in terms of tier one capital, the bank was completely wiped out after Q4, given unrealized losses on the balance sheets. So obviously we don't want to see the type of graphs again. This time around, that graph turned out to be a canary in the gold mine uh, and, and amongst uh, you know, dozens of other graphs. Um, but that said, um, where, where do we stand? We are in the very fortunate situation that 100% of our mandates, long and short term for mandates over 500 million SEAC, uh, $50 million, are all beating the benchmarks. So obviously, uh, this is something we're quite humble if, if for the fact that we, we probably won't maintain 100%. Um, but for the time being, we're quite happy that rates are beating with lower vol, uh, global equities are beating with lower vol. Uh, our allocation portfolios, low risk and medium risk, are uh, uh, starting to hit the upper bounds on what they should do as a maximum return, statistically speaking, uh, in, in a full year. Now, obviously, uh, given Friday's and this Monday's events, we have lost some value on this. Uh, but that said, uh, we uh, I think we lost about two weeks of equity momentum, uh, not, not more than that so far. Um, but we have to see how everything plays out. These are the positions we have. As you can imagine, we have taken uh, profit in half our European bank's position before this whole thing unraveled. And we're now looking into when we should take off the second half. And, to be perfectly honest, we might not be that far away, um, but we have to come back to that when we actually put our foot down. Italy, Norway, Nordics, uh, European, German, Japan, as you can see, we're still on a very European hefty or, or tilted portfolio, uh, which we think we're going to keep on uh, chugging along. And I, I should also say that currency wise, we are about 40% in dollars, about 40% in, 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 in euros and 20% in SEAC in this portfolio for the time being. Um, but we keep on working on this and, and for us it's more of a question on when we should take profit European banks that are on there anything else in order just to protect and, and get rid of some vol um, and see what else we can find to, to invest in. It will probably be another European investment. Uh, we haven't changed our forecast. Uh, we have bumped up the European Eurozone GDP slightly. Um, this is our medium uh, risk allocation, still maximum overloaded on, in terms of equities. We're happy to go, go, go with that. Um, it's funny to note that the, the products that our customers have bought are predominantly in global equities and, and, and rates, given mirroring our, our strategic allocation quite, quite neatly. Uh, I think we also need to remember the context of this whole thing happening. We still have to remember from a more holistic point of view that we are still going from a high to normal inflation and we're still in low growth, i.e. equity should bounce from minus 10% on average to 15% on the top side. And I think this is important to remind ourselves of the macro context because when we 
sort of when, when the clouds are, 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 are you know, blown away a bit in terms of the, the immediate risk on, on US banks, we were probably going to end up trading back on this macro context. We always want to keep that in mind. So when we make shifts in portfolios, we don't have too much work to get back to that kind of position because otherwise we're just going to drive costs way too much on, on the downside also on the, on, on the upside of, of go, going down and then up in risk. Now in terms of calculating should we be under or weight, we calculate the uh, statistical dependency or, or, or uh, degree to which we can be you know, firmly in 60-40 or 40-60 and quite neatly it's still the fact that 60-40 is outperforming 40-60s. Now this is calculated on a 30 day rolling window and obviously if you're more short term investor you should probably act more short term or long term, a bit more long term ish. But for us, this kind of makes quite a neat uh, kind of uh, investment environment to, to work with given what we have sold to our customers. And so for us, this is not the environment to yet start to make any shifts on strategic classification. It's rather, rather the contrary. You could challenge people being underweight equities, say, well, hang on a minute, why are you underweight? Because statistically, you made more money being overweight equities, depending on, 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 on your time frame. But it's quite, quite interesting. On geopolitical risk, we note that we're still on a, on a heightened level. Still, we're still sort of below the, the standard deviation on top side. But it's also quite interesting to shift from a global view on, on geopolitical risk to a more local or more country-wide. So we can see that the world geopolitical risk now has almost disappeared. But we can actually see small flares here and there, like Brazil, given what happened a few months ago, and, and China. So this is something we granularly track uh, all the time and we also calculate the, um, the, the statistical dependency between geopolitical risk and equity markets. Right now there is none, which is quite positive I guess given all the bad things going on in the world, uh, but it's something we do monitor. There are a couple of slides now just to remind ourselves that behind all this, inflation is keep on falling lower. Disinflation is here and it's, it's not going to go away. Uh, arithmetically, base effects giving month-to-month -month changes, you need to have dramatic changes in month-to-month -month in order to see stabilization on, 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 the, um, on the CPI level. And we believe we're going to be at 6% uh, and, and the data is out tomorrow, uh, or Tuesday I should say. Uh, one of the variables that works for lower inflation is the, uh, how we get rid and how we clear inventories. Uh, another thing is to look at the common inflation expectations from Fed or 5 year, five year break evens. I'm just going to go through this fairly quickly. Housing prices have collapsed, uh, leading with the future lead time that the owner equivalent rent or shelter will start to roll over again. And that's obviously quite important because that's where the, the next big leg lower in CPI will occur. It will occur given the fact that we've already seen house prices fall. There is a lag between house prices and shelter calculations about six months. So nothing extraordinary going on here. It's quite, quite ordinary. Uh, we do not agree with the uh, market that has been trading inflation expectations and arguing that inflation should pop back up to 9%. We think this is a bit of a, not a scaremongering, but I think there was a lot of trend following strategies that pushed the inflation expectations that are trading the market way too high. The market did a great job back in 2020 to, to anticipate the, uh, the rise in inflation. But since then, uh, there's no way we're going to have inflation at 9%. So we're happy to go, go against this. And this is one reason why we hold on to long treasuries. Obviously, given the bank crisis or the bank blowout that we've seen last uh, Friday and today, you know, we, we made a huge windfall in that position, giving all that back and then some on the equity side. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, we can't forget the CPI story behind this as well. Supply bottlenecks sharply lower. Uh, New York Fed came out and made some noise actually yesterday when they came out and said the global supply chain pressure is actually deflationary. And they got some pushbacks and then people agree with it, people disagree with it. I mean, whatever, the data is what it is. It, it sort of confirms what we've already seen in other data points. We don't question it. And it's obvious to us that you have a disinflationary pressure from, from supply bottlenecks. The underlying uh, inflation model from the US is rolling over. The demand push that we saw pushing inflation up has rolled over to now be more of a push down in terms of both lower demand but also supply factors. So this is sort of everything still working for this disinflationary environment. We don't see CPI as sticky. The data points that people point out like core sticky CPI excluding shelter, the mean, the wages um, and services, they're all rolling over following the headline inflation. 
nothing new. It's always like that with some leads and lags. Um, so there's nothing new in terms of that we're going to see that, yes, given the, the dramatic fall off in, 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 in headline inflation, it will sort of spread and go into the more core or sticky um, data points as well. And also don't forget, China is exporting deflation. That's hugely important given that China is now exporting a tremendous growth, um, but also disinflation or even deflation. That is, and we're going to come back to that, but that's pivotal uh, for what's happening in the global economy. And don't forget the year of the base effects. This I just took an example of natural gas and timber, just to show the sharply lower, almost, I mean, some, some cases actually, uh, triple uh, di uh, triple uh, digits in terms of natural gas futures on, on, on how they're plummeting on a year-on-year -year basis. So quite, quite big ramifications from this. Now the wage growth is also turning lower and, and coming in lower and lower. Again, no surprise for those of you who follow the data that we show each bi-weekly. The consumer uh, inflation expectations is about 1.5%. Nothing new there really. Um, and, and it's quite interesting to compare that with the price inflation expectations that are 9% um, and 1.5%. There's, there's a big spread here. And we have decided, uh, given, given our analysis, that we believe more in the consumers than the, the market, um, especially as break-even curves are con, con, con agreeing more with the consumer than anything else. And also, don't forget, there is no relationship between unemployment rate and inflation. Uh, so this Phillips curve is pretty much um, uh, over and gone with. Now obviously you can find different time periods where it's worked, but I think on a more objective point of view, looking at all the data since 1990, uh, it doesn't seem to work anymore. It's actually so that you have a positive relationship still between unemployment rate and wages, oh, sorry, unemployment rate and, and inflation, i.e. higher unemployment rate, high inflation, lower unemployment rate, lower inflation. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite, quite, quite interesting. And also, we, we are sticking to our uh, alternative, uh, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence story. The fact that Fed will still cut, and obviously, given today's price movements, we're down here somewhere, so we're 1.25 uh, percentage points of cuts going into the next two years' time. Um, that is probably we think is going to lift tech sector. We just had to go through these days of stress in terms of the the banking situation. Now, uh, the Fed outlook is this is it's almost irrelevant with these graphs because they changed so much this Friday, but obviously the curve is falling down. The, uh, the, the anticipated fund fund futures are now completely priced out at 50 basis points high from the Fed. So now we're sort of spread in between zero and, and 25. Um, we think it's important to remember that the uh, dovishness in terms of their written sp uh, um, word from a natural language programming point of view peaked in, in uh, um, uh, June of 2022. This is where we put in uh, our, our, our uh, maximum equity allocation and took away cash positions and short positions. Uh, the pivot occurred, of, obviously, in, in 2022, then in, in rates and so forth. And there's nothing really changed here because obviously then inflation rolled over and everything. And so we, we shouldn't forget, I think, that macro context, which we always fall back on and why the market is, seems to be more in line of buying the equity market than anything else. Now, obviously, what we're seeing is that we're pricing this is back in October 2022. We were priced 75 basis points and then boof, we got inflation and bye bye 75 basis points. Now we priced uh, 50 basis points and then boof, they had the banking crisis and now it's bye bye 50 basis points and maybe even bye bye 25 basis points hike. It's sort of the, the mirror image in terms of developing the Fed fund futures, but obviously the triggers are vastly different. Now, do we believe that uh, this type of peak will be as constructive for equity markets at the end of October 2022? I think it was easier and uh, tradable in October 2022 because it was such a black and white uh, market in that sense. It's, it would be a bit more difficult this time around. We believe that you have to be tactically quite active in order to find Italy, to find uh, uh, what else you would take? Um, the European banks or, 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 or the Nordics or whatever. You just can't buy, I think, the equity market as such. Um, we're quite reluctant on going too quickly into the US. We have, we're putting in uh, like semiconductors, artificial intelligence, and, and sort of the high tech spectrum of it or anything. I think that's where we're going to get the better risk reward and rates are turning lower. However, we're not, we're not putting in uh, more in terms of uh, SP 500 or anything like that. Uh, obviously, these have to be updated, but the, you have uh, a, 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 this perfect harmony between US and, and the ECP 
and given the fact that ECB would actually now be a bit more hawkish according to what the market expects. Um, when I wrote this, there was done deal with 50 basis points. Now it's 50, 50, 50 25 basis points. Um, and the US is even lower. But that said, what's quite interesting with this is that the market has never doubted that the peak will be quite soon in terms of rates and then we can look forward to cuts before the year ends. Uh, so nothing new here really. In terms of rates, we thought given underlying inflation pressure in our own model that rates were coming lower. Now obviously, I think we're down here somewhere below three and a half on the US a tremendous move in, 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 in the bond market, helping other banks that have made similar balance sheet choices like, like Silicon Valley Bank. But quite interesting uh, to, to, to look at in the, the kind of downwards pressure that we've seen. I mean, this is a great trade. We are long US treasuries from 4.2 4, 4, 4 on, on a yield basis. Great trade, poor trade, great trade, very poor trade, but we sort of hung on to it given the fact that we think we had enough model uh, indicating this disinflation environment. Um, so we see how, see how it takes us. Obviously now this is being catapulted by, by the banking risk. And I'll come back to the spread effect on the banking risk. We shouldn't forget that the global market has been, uh, the, the peak hawkishness in global markets were back in August 2022, which is quite important to remember. Uh, in terms of financial conditions, it's been one of those predictions for 2023 that we will peak and come in lower. It has, it has bumped up a bit since Friday, but it's important to remember that the big pivot call back in October 22 stands. And we're actually rolling over in terms of, of, of financial conditions, quite, quite, quite neat. And actually, if you look at financial conditions, depending on how you calculate it, you can also see that it was quite stable last Friday. And I think that's very important for us because that means that the market is not anticipating another Lehman, which we sort of need to get, get rid of, uh, the, the risk of another Lehman. Um, the, we see a little bit of a, a macro rebound. Obviously, the recession risk is still way below 25%. We see the uh, soft landing, uh, heightened recession risk, and also obviously rate cuts there, so it's nothing, nothing new. Um, and then you have this big interesting graph, which we really stuck our hands up back in October 2022, calling for a trough and rebound in global economics. And then the data has now confirmed that that forecast built on data was the right one. And I think it's quite interesting to look at Germany, look at European Union, uh, look at even Sweden, and also look at China, more so than and Japan, more so than, than the US, uh, which we think we're going to pick up for a little bit later on. Uh, in terms of US, we can start to see on a year-on-year -year basis, it starts to pick up some good speed, which is great. And this follows the pickup we've already seen in Sweden. And just for fun, uh, I put in the SCB's uh, GDP indicator that was way too, I was about to say boring, but way too negative. And now it's been revised and pushed up to no one expected this, apart from everybody looking at OECD data. Uh, that there's the SCB data was way, way too negative and now we start to see positive growth from SCB data. Actually, uh, there were only three economists, three banks that are making forecasts on this data point and they were all wrong. Uh, and I think it's quite neat now that the OECD is making a better job to anticipate Swedish growth than um, the Swedish Statistical Central Bureau uh, or local banks. It's always something good to be learned there. Um, in terms of data, uh, I've gone through a number of data points uh, and I will quickly on one page look at the next week's most important data points. So we see retail sales coming in lower but still positive. Month on month uh, uh, production numbers are picking up and housing in terms of actual uh, um, activity is picking up. And also quite important, CPIF, uh, according to Money Market Players, where we are also taking part of that survey, we, see, we and our colleagues are seeing a peak and, and rolling over in, in Swedish CPIF. And that would be quite interesting for the Corona and the Riksbank, given what's happened now in the world around us. Because where everything is going on and repricing in terms of the ECB and Fed and the banking and a peak in CPIF, it would be quite interesting to see if they're going to roll in and be a bit more dovish. And I think they will, actually. The equity outlook, and this is what I alluded to before in terms of China, it, it's very difficult not to exaggerate the, the importance of the Chinese rebound and look at how high frequency economic data, international flights, metro traffic, box offices, port congestions, road congestions, and it's just a massive blowout in terms of set, set scores. And you have a massive growth in liquidity. So we'd like to try to keep on to Chinese equities, even though we are carrying a poor result from, from the effect of the party conference. Now we took a huge stop loss on that position. Um, but we, we're keeping a proportion of it, given the fact that things are looking that well and we think it would be pretty difficult 
to jump in again. So, so and obviously after we took that partial stop loss, we have had a on the on the relative basis from that point of view a, a, a nice run. But from the position's beginning, we still have some way to go. Uh, in terms of the daily range indicator, i.e. smart money index, we see that institutions are buying like they haven't been buying the, in this magnitude since 2021. Uh, margin depth is crawling back. The equity sentiment is actually pushed up a bit higher last Friday, which is quite interesting given how the institutional investors are looking at the equity market, i.e. any sell-off is more and more a buying opportunity, you set to time it right. And the U.S. is not the same as our, this is the development on the U.S. Um, um, S&P 500 um, and I put in our global equity uh, portfolio here and then what I want to conceptualize that we were, we were pretty close to all time of the yearly highs, the S&P 500 was not. So when we model and work on the S&P 500 we also have to remember, or I'd like you as guests to remember that that's actually not where we put our money, we're much more into European Union for the time being which makes us to have a different um, and development in our portfolio than S&P 500, obviously. Um, just want to make that point very to be totally transparent on that. A risk model is still indicating very lofty and, and positive uh, growth for for um, uh, um, risk in, in, in the global system. Um, now, it's it quite important. This is one of the indicators that we use to study the effects of the banking crisis. Because if it was to spread we should see that liquidity in bonds starts to deteriorate in both traded and non-traded, secondary and primary markets, etc. And quite interesting, so far we haven't seen this. Um, and if the Fed, Treasury, Biden administration and FDIC are successful in the ring fencing of, of, the, of the bank blowout, this will not spread. But we keep monitoring it because obviously the fear is that it might. Uh, and this is a, a good indicator for that. And so far, so good. We have to see. Uh, another thing that helps equities obviously is the equity inflows from, from uh, cash positions uh, going, going into um, uh, equity markets. Uh, we can skip the portfolio, oh, sorry, options. Another thing I want to end up with is these big theorems, which I think are quite often forgotten in terms of the impact on um, uh, the equity market. It's quite, quite important to remember that stuff like Tobin's Q replacement cost of capital is still supportive of equity markets. So I mean, we are still in this big uh, rebound idea from these big theorems. Total factor productivity, marginal factor productivity, still a big rebound. Uh, in terms of um, P numbers and how we can measure that in terms of making it cyclically adjust and put it on a rolling basis so we can actually trade upon it. We saw the buy signal in June 2022, maximum weight since, and the trough in this signal was in July 2022, and it has been in a buying mood since then. I think that's quite important to remember that from a valuation point of view, if you want to trade upon valuation models, um, you should actually be a bit long. And, and this liquidity ratio is quite important also because it, it signifies the importance of measuring in green when the market is more prone to, to, to catch and follow the equity on the upside than it's stressed to avoid equities on the downside. As such, and this is still growing on the upside, we can actually see uh, more and more interest of being part of the upside than people are stressed if they get a few days of, 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 of sell-offs. And that's obviously quite different from where we've been. Uh, now, important to, to end up with are the predictions we made for 2023 in terms of earnings revisions and price target revisions. Because we went out and said that we we're going to see a rebound. And this is global growth. We said a rebound, we have a rebound. Earnings revisions, we have a rebound. Price target revisions, we have a rebound. This is quite important. I will show you why we made those forecasts. But why they're so important to capture is that sometimes you hear a lot of about earnings will come in poorly, we have an earnings recession and all that. But do not forget that if you want to trade on the equity market, I would argue you have to look at earnings revisions, not 12-month forward EPSs or actual EPS forecast because they're lagging. They lag the revisions, the lag on the upside, the lag on the downside, the upside on the downside and the lag on the trough. They always lag. If you want to trade on the equity market, you have to look at the revisions, earnings revisions, and then you have to play around with the revisions to compare what are the uh, corporate revision numbers and what are the analyst revisions numbers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for me, it's quite telling that, and there's, I know there's an argument in the market that the market doesn't seem to care about falling EPSs and poor profit cycle and everything. And yes, but we traded that in 2022. The the idea that 12-month forward EPS should be forward-looking is completely wrong. It should actually be retitled 12-month 
lagging EPS or something, or backwards looking EPS. But just a quick statistical point of view to, to home in the point that don't be fooled by, by earnings calls, because uh, yes, earnings are poor, they're gonna be poor, but we don't trade on that. For the equity market, you have to trade on earnings revisions, I would argue. Um, why is earnings obviously is a lot more important for, for other issues if you want to buy debt or anything like that. And why do we then know that earnings revisions will trough and rebound? Well, all we have to do is look at macroeconomic surprises. So we're going back to the macro side. And this is why China and why the global rebound and why the soft landing in the US is so important. Because when we get positive economic surprises, it leads to positive earnings revisions, which leads the equity market. And then 12 months later, uh, 12 months forward EPSs and actual EPSs will react. This is sort of the, the, the grand scheme of things, which I think is quite, quite important. And sometimes this is, might be wrong, but, but as you can see in the graph, it's quite often quite telling to have a good idea of the underlying macro environment uh, go, going forward. Now, obviously also as a final reminder, it's a huge difference 2023. We look at expansionary in terms of global credit impulse indicator and, and world centix index compared to the end of 2021, where you saw a contraction of the two. So there's a completely night and day here, which is very important to, to remember. Um, so so it's, I'll leave you with those points, um, and I will um, be back in a couple of weeks. Hopefully we have sorted out and received some calmness given the, uh, the, the packages that the US has presented in terms of ring fencing. Obviously UK is doing their part as well. Uh, Germany has been out commenting this and I think it has also been investigated to, to some extent in Sweden. Um, that said, we still are quite positive on the back row, backdrop in terms of flows, valuations, um, how people are trading, sentiment, uh, risk indicators. Um, macro um, earnings revisions uh, and so forth that we're going to stick to to await equities. We might do a change, i.e. we might want to protect ourselves and, uh, and protect our profit on European banks, but we had to come back to how, when and if. Um, and, and with that said, uh, I wish you all a, a happy afternoon or, or whatever it is where you are and I'll be back in a couple of weeks time. Thank you so much for your attention.